Every working day between 5.15 and 5.30, the Renfrew factory empties. 6,000 men from the works and 1,000 staff from the offices poured out into the streets. Yet, a quarter of an hour later, there's hardly a soul about. It's the daily miracle. Miracle, my foot. Don't think it's aye been like this, because it hasn't. I can remember not so long ago, we had to hang about in the cold, queuing for trams and buses at the top of the road. After a day's work, when you want to get home to a fire and your tea, this can be the last straw. Oh, but it's true, things have changed. Partly the war, I suppose, and partly signs of the time. New ideas, new ways for working folk all over the country. Oh, they look after you better nowadays, all right. Uh, it's a very different story now. Take a chap like me. Me and the wife decided to take a house out in one of these new estates, away from all the grit and dirt. But what's the good if you can't get to work without a lot of sweat? And how would we do that without special buses? Since the war, a whole system of buses has been worked out to enable people to get to and from work with the least possible trouble. Well over 2,000 men and women from the works at Renfrew now rely entirely on these services, which pick them up from inaccessible spots such as Priest Hill and Craigie Lee, or congested places like St. Tina's Square, and take them back at night. And there's Renfrew Ferry, where so many folk from other works are milling around at the same time. And take the trains, for instance. There's a station right on the doorstep. Three specials run down from St. Pierce in the morning and another up to carry away the night shift. A train in the evening coincides with the work's exit. And there's also the familiar and friendly figure of Mr. Graham, the station master, to see that everything goes all right. There's no doubt about that popularity, as you can see. Nineteen trams come in here in the morning. It's one of my jobs to see everything goes to plan, and this corner's only a bit of it. I was glad when the extension was made. It saved me one of my biggest headaches. In the old days when that tram had to stop on the main road, there was a jam up every day. No traffic get by, people were all over the place, and no joke either, especially if the rain's coming down. Then, soon after the war, Bob Cox and the corporation got together to get an extension down Porterfield Road. Costs were shared, and Bob Cox put down two-thirds of the money, I'm told. Now it's possible for up to 20 trams to be marshaled on the side in the cope of the rush. Ah, everything goes quite smoothly now. Many improvements come about through the action of the Workers' Transport Committee, which includes representatives from the shops, and regularly discusses any problems or grievances. For instance, here's Sandy with a complaint. Something about a tram that's been held up a couple of mornings running, and made him and his mates late for work. Will Joe see if he can get the committee to do something about it? And Joe's as good as his work. Mr. Carmichael, who is secretary of the committee, promises to ask the corporation for an explanation. A letter goes out the same day. The tram people look into the matter on the spot at the depot. 
The explanation is phoned, and the corporation's letter read to the committee at its next meeting. The committee knows that with the backing of the management and the confidence entrusted in it by the men, it can put a case that compels attention. Miracle indeed. It's not a miracle then, but a lot of hard work and goodwill in everybody's part. Management, the transport companies, the transport committee, and us fellows out at the works. There's an efficient, speedy and cheap means of getting to and from the works. Everyone knows that attention is given to grievances or suggestions through the committee. And the missus knows just when to pop the supper in the oven. But here, just a minute. Who said there was no such thing as miracles? 